He gave them 10 manas, and he said to them, engage in business until I come. Do business with this. Get to work with my investment. Put my money to work while I'm away. Now, Jesus is effectively saying here that he has made an investment in the members of his household to this day, which would be you and me as followers of Christ. He's put something in our hands to steward for the sake of his kingdom. What will you do with the time you have? Will you make the most of the talents God's given you? These are the questions Jesus put to his disciples as he prepares to leave them. He used the example of a nobleman going away and leaving his servants to manage his affairs. Jesus helps the disciples understand what their responsibilities will be for the time between Jesus' first ascension and his second coming. That's the period we live in today. So, it's very important that we understand this. To this day, we share the same responsibilities as those disciples. The older I have become, the more I'm encouraged by transparent saints of old, like William Carey, who wrote in his journal, we know him as the father of modern missions, a man who translated the Bible into several languages, wrote a grammar, started a university, Seemed to accomplish so much for the Lord, but this wasn't how he viewed himself. He wrote this in his journal. If after my death, anyone should think it worth his while to write something about me, if he simply refers to me as a plotter, he will describe me correctly. Anything beyond that would give me too much credit. I have simply plotted my way through life, one task after another, and to plotting I owe everything, just plodding along. It occurs to me that even while you're plodding along, there's one thing in life that you don't want to see sitting idle. In fact, you want to see it moving forward, and that is your investments in life. If you've invested... um, money in some kind of interest-bearing account or some kind of investment plan, when you call the checkup on that, you would never want them to say, well, you know, we're just not doing anything about it right now. We just set it over on the sideline. Hope that's fine with you. No, you want to see it growing, don't you? If you've invested time in discipling a new believer, you want to see that investment yield spiritual growth, don't you? If you've invested energy in, in, in a hobby or a job, you, you want something in return, even if it's nothing more than just the satisfaction of knowing you finished something. The trouble is, we rarely think of ourselves as God's investment. We are his investment. He has invested in us. He has invested us in the currency of life. And he wants to see his investment at work. Now that doesn't mean he's against taking a nap. The Lord took a nap, didn't he? Glad that passage is in there. He's so tired, he slept through a storm. But he wouldn't want to see us idle, lazy, but staying at it, plodding through it using the investment God has made in us through life. Now, we're about to be given an incentive uh, from a parable the Lord is going to deliver on sort of resisting this lull of laziness. We're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, and now we're at verse 11. And Luke sets the stage for us by telling us here in verse 11... As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear uh, immediately. Now, this multitude 
thinks they're going to arrive in Jerusalem and they're going to watch Jesus just, you know, kind of pull back the veil on his miraculous power and, and uh, overthrow the Roman government and usher in the glorious kingdom of God. Yes, Jesus has offered legitimately the kingdom to the nation. The religious leadership and the nation at large has rejected his kingship. This parable isn't, isn't uh, suggesting that Jesus hasn't offered the kingdom or that the kingdom isn't going to come in a future day. This parable is now revealing to them the postponement of the kingdom and what the followers of Christ are to do in the meantime. There's going to be a delay in the coming of the kingdom. So far, by the way, that delay has lasted 2,000 years and counting. But that delay is the opening point Jesus makes here now in verse 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Now, Jesus' audience would immediately understand this illustration. In the Roman Empire, when a man was going to become a king over some region in the empire. He had to first travel to Rome and and receive that appointment from Caesar. We know from history that Herod the Great traveled to Rome to receive this uh, privilege from the emperor. Herod's sons, after his death, had had to do the same thing uh, later on. So in, in symbolic language, Jesus is the nobleman who is about to leave. He's going away to a far country. That refers to his ascension back to heaven after his resurrection, where Jesus is then seated at the right hand of God. He's not, he's not sitting on top of God's right hand, as one little child got it, got it wrong in Sunday school. Jesus isn't sitting on God's right hand. He's sitting at God's right hand. That's, that's an expression of saying he's sitting in the place of divine authority. Ephesians 1 spells it out. He has the right to rule the universe. Now, pictured in this parable before he leaves town, the nobleman makes an investment in, in hard cash puts it into the hands, the stewardship, the management of his followers. Notice verse 13. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten manas. That, by the way, is around six months' salary of a typical individual. And he said to them, engage in business until I come. Literally, uh, do business with this. Get to work with my investment. Put my money to work while I'm away. Now, Jesus is effectively saying here that he has made an investment in the members of his household to this day, which would be you and me as followers of Christ. He's put something in our hands to manage, to steward for the sake of his kingdom. Now verse 14 adds a little drama to the scene, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Again, they would have understood this historically. In fact, when Herod, one of Herod's sons wanted to rule over Judea, he traveled to Rome to get that assignment. And 50 Jewish men traveled along as well to argue against him, to tell Caesar why he shouldn't be their king. And Caesar ignored them and gave Herod's son the right to rule. Now, now, Jesus is hinting then here at this crowd. He knows that in a few days, they are going to be telling the Roman authorities they don't want him to be their king, and they're going to all chant, we have no king but Caesar. He's predicting that. So tucked now, tucked into this parable, you, you have three responses to this nobleman's investment, so to speak. And authority, I'll give them to you ahead of time. Diligence, laziness, and defiance. Now first, here's diligence in action, verse 15. When he, the nobleman, returned 
having received the kingdom, that is the right to rule, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mana has made 10 manas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. In other words, His diligence is now rewarded with responsibility in this kingdom that has essentially arrived. Now, I know this might not sound appealing. It looks like his work is rewarded with more work. But in light of that coming kingdom, just imagine being able to work alongside of Christ. In our perfected state, our immortal bodies, without sin with unhindered uh, joy, with unlimited energy, we are now part of a royal court. Imagine co-laboring with our king, being brought into conference, uh, having him give us plans to fulfill. Now verse 18, the second servant came saying, Lord, your manah has made five manahs. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. By the way, keep in mind that this parable doesn't focus on giftedness, but faithfulness. Did you notice that each servant, all ten, are given the exact same amount? But none of them are going to receive a reward for sitting down and folding their hands and sitting it out, lazy idleness. And with that, we have the next Example, following the example of diligence, we're not given an example of laziness. Verse 20. Then another came saying, Lord, here's your mana, which I've kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He, the, the nobleman, said to him, well, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. In other words, if what you were saying is true... Verse 22, if you knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow, why then did you not at least, implied, put my money in the bank? And at my my coming, I might have collected it with interest. Jesus is exposing this lazy servant's cover-up. It was just an excuse. His excuse, in effect, was something like, well, I know how demanding you are, uh, but your investment in me you know, kind of put me in a, a no-win situation. I, I, I might invest it, but I might lose it. So I decided to play it safe and just sit it over on the shelf. I decided to you know, uh, stay out of harm's way. He makes his laziness sound like common sense. But the Lord knows his heart, his lazy spirit. And he takes his mana away, verses 24 to 26, and gives it to the servant who invested it most diligently. Now, let me add a word here. Be careful. Diligence and laziness are two responses of members of the nobleman's household. The lazy steward doesn't get kicked out of the household, but he does lose the fullest reward. So also today, we as Christians can be diligent or lazy. If you've come to faith in in Jesus Christ, your presence in the coming kingdom is guaranteed through salvation. But your position in the coming kingdom is determined by your service. You're getting into the kingdom because you're saved. You're going to be honored in the kingdom with responsibility because you served. It's the idea of the bema. That's the idea of rewarding diligence. Your salvation is a gift from God. Period. Your service is is your gift back to God and he will reward you in a literal way, in a literal kingdom that is literally going to arrive. 
So here's the incentive to resist the lull of laziness. Uh, Your place of responsibility and honor in the kingdom is going to be a reward for your service to Christ while you're alive. Every day you plod through adds to your privilege one day in the kingdom. The nobleman, just like the Lord today, sees through this man's excuse for not doing anything that put God's investment to work. And we battle our own set of excuses. Uh, they, they, they sound good to us, and we think, you know, God might buy it. It might sound something like, well, you know, I'm, I'm really not ready to serve in that way. Or, or someone else is more prepared to tackle that role. Or I, I, might not, I might not do the best job, but uh, somebody else could. In fact, if I can't do it perfectly, it's better that someone else try. Others are more gifted than me, so I'll let them serve instead. I'm not really needed that much. There seems to be plenty of other people around. Or I tried serving and wasn't appreciated for it. Or it would seem proud to me to take the initiative. So if somebody asks me, I'll serve. Or I'd rather avoid conflicts and stay out of harm's way. Or I'm not doing anything that important anyway, so why strive for excellence? And on and on and on and on. And we make our laziness sound like common sense. You might think that your service has to be something spectacular in order to make honorable mention. Not at all. It goes back here to the idea of plodding through the smallest task. You know, he didn't give these stewards a king's ransom, six months' salary. In fact, he called it a little, just a little. How you tackled that job. How you handled that responsibility. How how you treated that homework assignment, that load of laundry, that work project, that ministry task. The Bible says God is not unjust to overlook your work, your love, which you've shown in his name. He doesn't miss anything. That's bad news, but it's also good news. Our privilege and responsibility in the kingdom will be delivered to us in that assignment when he rewards that which was profitable, the Bible says. Every little thing. So we have diligence shown here, laziness shown here. Finally, we see defiance here, verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine... Who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Now, in the context of this parable, a king would immediately move against a rebel presence that threatens his reign. Kings in these days would eliminate their enemies when they ascended the throne. Now, the application of this parable refers to the final judgment against those who have rejected King Jesus. This is a timeless warning, by the way. A severe warning for those who defy King Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul picks the warning up and repeats it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He writes, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. So the defiant unbelieving world is shown here, hating Jesus, defying Jesus, rejecting his right to rule, saying they do not want him. Judgment is simply God giving them their wish. 
They will live forever without him. But what about those of us who are members of his household? The ones in whose hands he's placed an investment. Uh, Let me offer two timeless truths from this parable. These are going to help pull us out of the lull of laziness. First, let's develop a godly perspective of anticipation. It's interesting to me that, that diligence and anticipation are connected in this parable. Resisting the lull of laziness is related to anticipating the reality of the kingdom. We as believers tend to forget the kingdom. We think it's here and then we're going to float on a cloud one day. No, it's here and if we're alive, the rapture seven years later, the kingdom on earth for a thousand years arrives and we with him. And we will have responsibility and privilege and honor as co reignees with Christ. Everything we do for Christ will be rewarded by Christ in this coming kingdom. We, we typically skip over that thousand years. We get to serve him now. We will serve with him then. And in the meantime, we're to engage in business Today, Jesus says, back in verse 13, engage in business until I come. Put my investment that I have placed in you to work. As if to say, don't let my money sit on a shelf. Do something with it, great or small, appreciated or unappreciated. Maybe it's widely known. Maybe it's known only to God because your work is in prayer, in private. Engage in business until I come. I love the way one author applied this text. To engage in business until I come. I I need this verse, he writes, etched into my desk at work, written on a sticky note at the top of my computer pinned to my dashboard, taped to my lawnmower handle. I need it everywhere at all times. For God has given us each a mana, talents, responsibilities, families, neighbors, jobs, social platforms, ministries, hobbies. They are all divine investments. We're not just stuck between the resurrection of Christ and the coming rapture of the church. We're not stuck Our little prayers, our little words, our little deeds may not seem to be accomplishing much in this world, but we will see they made a world of difference one day when we see the king. I mean, it makes you want to go to work. Probably not to the job you don't want to go to tomorrow, but you know what I mean. Go to work using whatever it is to bring glory to to God. So, so we live with this kind of anticipation. And I can tell you, the older I get, the more I think about the kingdom every single day. Secondly, let's resist the gravitational pull of procrastination. That's the temptation to just kind of sit it out, to disengage, to put it off. In his last letter to Timothy, Paul delivers this challenge to young Timothy, and he writes this. Listen to this. Timothy, let me remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. That is a very convicting challenge to me. Timothy, it's your responsibility to fan into flame what God ignited in you. Fan it into flame. This was Timothy's responsibility. Add the fuel of of spiritual disciplines and godly anticipation and self-sacrifice and godly desire. You, You stir those embers daily when you do the right thing. When you plod on. Live with a sense of kingdom anticipation. Resist that gravitational pull of procrastination. We fight it every day, don't we? Resist the lull of a lazy life. Leonardo da Vinci, by the way, I found in my study, it was interesting. He 
obviously considered one of the most diversely talented individuals to have lived, an inventor, a student of human anatomy. His thoughts were way ahead of his culture. An architect, an engineer, dabbled with what is today a helicopter, hydraulics, best known as an artist. It's interesting that even though this was his occupation, his output was tragically small. Only 17 paintings are definitively attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Several were left unfinished. It was due, one author writes, to his chronic procrastination. He often had to be threatened by his patrons that they would withhold payment in order to motivate him to keep working. The Mona Lisa took 15 years to finish. Another painting had been commissioned with a seven-month deadline. They tried to pressure him to finish it. He finished it 25 years later. On his deathbed, Leonardo da Vinci apologized He said just before he died that he wanted to apologize to God and to mankind for leaving so much undone. How do you avoid that deathbed? Regret. By imitating Timothy who went on to fan the flame. By imitating William Carey who decided to simply plod on to finish one task at a time to decide afresh even today to put God's investment he has made in you to work. That was Stephen Davey, and he called this message, Resisting the Law of Laziness. With this message, Stephen brings to a close his series through this portion of Luke. It's called Parables and Prophecies. If you missed any of the lessons in the series, or if you'd like to listen to the full-length version, they're posted to our website. You can listen to all 13 messages, watch the video version, or read Stephen's manuscript at wisdomonline.org. When we come back next time, Stephen will have a two-part series called The Final Doxology. Be sure and join us for that here on Wisdom for the Heart. Wisdom for the Heart.